Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a returning guest. It's kind of like a 10-year anniversary slash 12-year recap slash whatever I've been doing for all these decades in interviewing creative people. And this person, of course, you have heard her on the show and seen her on the show before. She's been a co-host, uh, a proponent of the LGBTQ plus plus community. And of course- I can't keep up with it anymore yeah, either. I can't either. <laughs> and of course, uh, uh, a wonderful supporter of, of all things comics. You've seen her work, of course, on House of the Muses. We are catching up today with the wonderful and talented Pam Harrison. How are you doing today, Pam? Hey, Kurt. I'm doing great. Glad to see you again. How have you been? I am you know, surviving. It's uh, doing what I can. But um, I was, the reason why we're having this interview, and it's a couple of things. One of the reasons is that uh, I was putting up the show on IMDb, and I was going through my old archive. And I, just, oh, yeah? I, I saw that we did a, a theme month for the LGBT community. And you, of course, were a, a, a co-host, and uh, you had a, you were interviewing a wonderful, great guest that we had in the past. And I was like, I got to catch up with her. I haven't seen her in forever. So how you? I'm been? telling you, we've had some great times together yeah. online. We've we've covered a lot of great artists. We've covered a lot of great projects. Yeah, yeah. A yeah. lot of things come and go. Yeah, a lot of comics come and go. A lot of a lot of comics. Yeah, yeah, and new stuff on the way. But uh, House of the Muses was one of those comics where it was done in 3D Poser, if I recall correctly. When I started it back in 2006, uh, it was unheard of to do a comic in CGI. And uh, Poser was a brand new product at the time. And when I first started doing it, my first efforts were okay, I guess. I've had some people say, oh, it was great, but no, I had plenty of critics say that it was really cheap looking and really odd, and uh, Poser comics began to be mentioned by certain critics with, with quotation marks, with all the uh, uh, implications, but as time went by, I got really, really good at it, mm -hmm. so... Uh, I, I was one of the first artists back in the day and from 20, 2006 on to pioneer the CGI comic industry. There had been a number of people doing it before, but it was not that like good. And, you know, the more insults I got, the more I was determined to seize it and make it mine. And so I, <laughs> I did pretty well with it. I've got some pieces that I'm really, really proud of. And um, so... You know, when I finally was able to wrap up House of the Muses in 2019, some of the work that I did on that final book was outstanding, you know, even by my self-critical standards. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm still working in the medium. I'm still doing some stuff. And uh, I'm at a awkward age point. I'm going to have to... Uh, Sorry, bump just... up my game a little bit, you know what I'm saying? So, um, I'm working currently on a science fiction series called A Deviant Mind, which has been going on even longer than House of the Muses. I, I started that, yeah, I started that back in 1980 when I was still 16 years old. And, uh, I started doing that in CGI in 2010. And, um, uh, this February literally marked 40 years since I've been writing stories. Oh, wow. And yeah, I, I was kind of a late starter. It took me all the, the up till the 2000s to get everything in print, but I've been doing stories for a long, long time. And I still got a long way to go, so here we are. <laughs> so you'll be on, you know, next year then. <laughs> I plan on it. <laughs> That's good. Well, because I, I remember Deviant Mind because that was back in, oh, was that Drunk Duck Days or? Yes, I started it on Drunk Duck back in 2010, July 2010, in fact, and uh, so it's been 10 years on that, too. Um, but yeah, like I said, the first stories of, of Deviant Mind I still have written in pencil here in my studio from 1980 when we were piddling around with that. And some pencil pages that I'm not going to show anybody because, you know, 
my penciling has improved to the four groups. Thank you. But I'm going to take those old pencil stories and those old uh, um, written notebooks and start something later this year called Tales of the Real World. I'm going to go retro on that. Oh, really? Yep. With with a deviant mind, I'm going to have some back pages in pencil, do some pencil inking and coloring and so forth, kind of get back to the roots. Too. Nice. Kind of bringing it full circle. Oh, well, you know, it, it, you've been doing this for, for a long time, obviously, and you've done, you, you keep doing it. What what drives you after 40 years to, to keep doing this? I don't know. But, <laughs> no, seriously, I've been through some rough times where I had writer's block, and, you know, we've been through some, uh, a lot of rough times over the last few years, but mm -hmm. when you get right back to it, you know, um, you keep coming back and coming back and coming back, because the characters that I created are a heck of a lot tougher than I am. They had gone through, I, uh, one of my big fans, Jerry Lee, says I put certain characters through all kinds of garbage and you keep coming right back. So the, <laughs> writing these stories about heroes is kind of a testament to the human spirit itself. You know, all these artists um, spend years trying to do stories and trying to make their stories heard and get them to new audiences. And, you know, it all comes back to never give up. You know, what? You know, tell your story, get it. House of Muses, House of the Muses. I keep short forming it to House of Muses. The, the, it's okay. Since we've always, since I've known you, I've always short formed it for some. Sense. It's fine. <laughs> when that finally ended, was it was it a, a relief? Was it the fact that you know you had finally finished a story that you you know that was really well done and that you enjoyed, or was it just? No, let's move on to the next one. Have you? No, I'll be I'll be really honest with you. When I finished House of the Muses nine back in twenty twelve, we had uh, Deke the main character, and she and she's always been the narrator of the series from front to back, mm -hmm. from front to back, start to finish. And um, she was at a stopping point with the story, and she said, "I can no longer bear to look at this story because I know how it ends." And I from 2012 to 2019 I went on a hiatus because kind of like Dika I had gotten totally attached to these characters and uh, I knew how the story ended I had the story written from 1987 and um, so yeah it was like saying goodbye to an old friend and at 2019 I had piddled around for the last couple years of that and someone said it's time to do this it's time to go uh, a couple of bottles of wine later and so yeah, yeah. but I finally got through House of Loses 10 and it, it, there's a surprise ending to it and another fan of mine Michael Beasley who had been there from start to finish he got his hands on House of Loses 10 he says oh my god he said I read this story and it totally blew me away he said I had to put it down for a week and then I came back to read it and I came back and I had the same reaction he said I cried he said bravo moto bravo I'm so glad you finally were able to finish this magnum opus I was like wow for me I was you know, just <laughs> trying to wrap up the story but it was really really intense story House and Moose's 10 has a very intense ending and um, I, I, I'm um, like I say, when you invest yourself so deeply in a story and it won't let you go for 30 years, you know, and you have to wrap it up, it's interesting, but that's the kind of story House of Moose's Lewis. It wouldn't let me go until I put down that last page. Oh, and so, sorry. And, and so I was just like, for the next two, three months. It's interesting because there's not many people that I know that I've interviewed that have been doing it as long as you have. There's, there's a few, but not too many in at least in the comic industry um mm -hmm. at least our circle of comic industry um and i find it amazing the perseverance that one has to have to stick with a story to stick with characters no matter yeah. how much they put themselves through like right emotionally Some... and and sometimes me and yeah. mentally Just... To write the really, really good stories that that, that make it through the, the halls of time, you have to be really invested in the story. And 
I was really surprised that this one stuck with me so long, but like I said, it, it was one of those stories that wouldn't let you go until you finished it. And it was an emotional roller coaster to finish those last few pages, but once I did, it was a immense relief. And um, I'm really glad that I got through it. I, I was able to read through the story and... Uh, now this, see, that's how it's, it's too personal. I mean, it's fine to write superhero stories that are kind of flash in the pan, but you know, this this um, epic meant a lot to me, so I'm glad it was done. <laughs> but you know, it's I, I don't know if it'll ever be a classic, but it's good. <laughs> it's done. As long as you're you're good with how it turned out, as long as you're. Um, you know, you you've leave, leave you, well, you've left everything on the page. You know, that, right. that's all you can truly worry about. The rest is is history, as they say. Right. My only regret is that I went on hiatus too soon and was out of there for too long because House of the Muses back in its day had some worldwide acclaim. I mean, I got reviews from uh, the Netherlands, from Brazil, from Japan, from here, from there. You know, it was it was one of those stories that had worldwide acclaim so I, I do regret that I took such a long hiatus but you know it is what it is I got I was that invested in the story and I hope it will resonate with someone else somewhere down the road now with deviant mind give us a recap of that and and where is it currently where is it currently <laughs> 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 okay, Deviant Mind. Let me summarize it. Um, it begins with uh, th th this character called Tara shows up. Um, she's being pursued by someone, and she has total amnesia. She doesn't know who she is or where she comes from. And some people are trying to make sure that she's silenced. And um, the the premise of the story is that she tries to find out who has uh, imprisoned her and is hunting her currently and um, throughout time she ends up with um, these this young girl who claims to be the princess of Winnie Akai and um, over time that that blossoms a little bit and um, it's kind of hard to summarize a deviant mind because it, it has a wide scope. But Tara, does Tara ever find out who she is and where she comes from? Uh, only time will tell. And um, let's see. And we'll find out more about where she did come from and the, the room worlds and. <clears throat> What's going on with that? And a lot of a lot of stuff that I've done has also been political as well. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot of freewheeling science fiction, space opera, and we've had a lot of great fun stories. Whenever Jim Dyer chips in with me to co-write, the, the stories are hilarious and totally unpredictable. I've also written a couple stories with my son back when, um, uh, characterizing some of the other characters, and he gave them his own personal spin as as a military veteran. And those stories were really, really fantastic. So um, it's it's been a family affair, but. Um, we're still exploring the rewards where they left off. Um, Princess Najmi finally became queen of Winnie Akai and she and her sister and their aide were kidnapped by the characters two villains uh, Chess and Checkmate and if that doesn't make you wonder um, Checkmate and Chess had a disagreement so Checkmate took over the game and snatched off the queens of Winnie Akai and threw them into a situation where they have to find out what their parents did and uh, solve a couple of mysteries so that they can uh, proceed toward the future. And uh, right now they're stuck on a planet with an angry spirit, <laughs> <laughs> with with uh, teleportation portals everywhere, and it's like an old game of mist 
if you remember that oh, from yeah. way back when. Yeah. They're trying to remember or trying to find out how to activate every portal to get back to where we came from. So there <laughs> that I get to free will a lot. I was going to say, I think I might have still have the CD-ROM of Mist somewhere around here too. I do too. I have every one of them. Oh, wait, they made more than one? Uh, let's see, yeah, there was three of them, I think. Oh man, I only played the first. <laughs> see what a geek I am. Jeez. <laughs> well, I, I tip my hat to your geekiness, so there you go. Um, Let's talk about your co-hosting from the show itself, or, or we'll go back to your very first interview that we had, because that was back in 2009, I believe. That was yeah. A long time ago. Like, Wasn't that the LGBT thing? I believe it was, yeah. So so for those that don't know, Two Geeks Talking had a theme month for a good number Pride of Pride month. Yeah. Pride month, June 2009. Yeah, and uh, it, we specifically did Pride month in June, because that is, of course, Pride month. And of course, I asked Pam to be come on the show and, and be the co-host because back in that day, it was a lot easier to do audio and, and all that other stuff. Now it's video conferences and Skype's no more, and you know now we're with Zoom. <laughs> I, I can't recall. I think you brought it up that because I, if I recall, it was you approached me and said, you know what, with Pride Month coming up in June, we should have like a bunch of creators on the show. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure, let's do it. Um, why did you want to to bring those creative people on on to be talking? That was because you know that that period was also a, a, a learning period for me. See, um, when I was just coming out of the closet back in the eighties, it was really dangerous to be gay. So um, I went through a lot of. Uh, turmoil with uh, House of the Muses, whether it was for adult audiences or mature audiences or teen plus audiences, because no matter uh, what the topic matter, you know, in spite of the fact that all of the characters in House of the Muses were gay, except for one or two or whatever, um, my story itself was readable for teenagers, you know. Um, you know, there was there was one point where someone at a, a, a book meeting had grabbed up the book and said, oh, can my six-year-old read this? I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> but, um, like I said, back in, back in our day, back in the 80s, it was very dangerous to be gay. Um, you know, there, there were some instances, you know, I really don't want to care to relate, but um, you could be beaten up or harmed or even killed. Um, so we've had, we've had a lot of, uh, work with the gay rights movement too. And because I myself was getting worldwide acclaim with the series, I wanted to pull other artists in and get them in the spotlight as well. Because, you know, when you are able to bring other people into the limelight, more stories get told, more ideas get set aside. Um, the more you are able to express your stories and people say, oh, well, this is not as bad as I thought it was. You know, it's representation matters. Mm -hmm. And we wrote about this in uh, ICC Magazine a few years back, uh, representation matters. You have kids growing up, sitting in a closet, whether they're gay, black, Asian, Jewish, Hindu, mm -hmm. they're sitting in a closet quietly because, you know, they've been told that they're not allowed to represent themselves and that there's no one in the uh, media and comics or anywhere else representing them. You know, they have no heroes. Mm -hmm. and so I guess that, in retrospect, all these years later is why I said, hey, Kurt, let's have an LGBT series. <laughs> And it was, it was that's a, deep it, it but is but it's true I mean we like we we had some really great guests and people that their talent is still going on mm -hmm. um, and you know Pia Guerra is amazing yeah. I'm so glad we had, we had her on and she was also on with some other fellow Alex some 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 but yeah she was still 
in her early days back in 2009. Mm-hmm. She's gone on to be a huge political cartoonist. Oh, that's great. That's amazing. I haven't seen any of her work recently, but I, I should catch up on her stuff as well. Um, and, you know, those those interviews, though, they were hour-long interviews. They were, like, in-depth interviews. Um, mm-hmm. And We gave a lot of people their voice oh, yeah. back then. Yeah. And it's something I want to do again. I'd love to, to do another Pride Month again. It's been far too long, and it's a lot easier. And more people are more accessible with social media and with video conferencing and all that other stuff just so we can see and, and hear. But rather than just hear, we can see, you know, mm-hmm. the expressions, et cetera, of what they're going through and, and what they're showcasing with their talent. And then moving forward, there was an anthology as well you put together. That was, I think, the following year? Uh, Voices Against Bullying? That's it, yes. yes. Yeah, right over here. Right. Uh, there we go. Right there at the top, right there it is. But, yeah, we there was only two issues of it. People were very willing to submit stories over some of the basic stuff, but as soon as I said, uh, let's talk about racism, interest in the series completely petered out. Hmm. It like died. Because it's uh, so you can talk about gay rights, but you can't talk about racism? Like Correct. I don't know what the impetus on that was, but yeah, as soon as I put a comment out, I said, okay, um, our third issue of Voices Against Bullying, we're going to talk about racism. It was like, pfft. So when you suggested that that racism was the topic of the third issue, nothing occurred. It just Correct. there was no no one wanted to raise their voice at that. Mm-mm, not peep, hmm. crickets. And yet, so. with, and that was back in two thousand and thirteen. Thirteen. Yeah. So mm-hmm. seven years later, when we're at the height of a uh, of racism in the world, North America specifically, in this case. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it, it would be a perfect time to almost revisit that. <laughs> right. It almost seems too late at this point, but I don't know. Maybe I should try it again, but I don't know what I'd come up with this time. <sighs> Maybe the I, it, it depends on who you approach, and it depends on their story. You know, right? It's going to be one of those situations, but yeah, I thought I mean, it was, not, uh, sorry, not petting myself on the back, but I was always pretty good at calling things at the proper time. But yeah, that's... The, the, the very idea that I got crickets after the call for stories about racism was kind of telling. You're still working on Deviant Minds, but is there anything else that's coming up that you want to, that you're you're working on, or, is, or are you just really focused in on Deviant Minds? And... Oh, for the last three years now, I've been the chief editor of ICC Magazine. And those that, for those that don't know, what, what is ICC? ICC is Independent Creators Connection, and our website is at independentcreatorsconnection.com. Um, we were involved in a Facebook group founded by Terrence Baker in 2013, where he wanted to have a safe space for independent creators to come in and show off their work and network and even mingle and, mm-hmm. you know, do everything like that. and. Um, so we promote independent comic artists and when we started the icc magazine back in 2017 um we started you know doing some artist spotlight interviews we do some how-to stories um a lot of different features um in the second issue of icc magazine back in uh, spring of 2018 we had done a feature on the black panther movie and because of the representation that it represented, you know, um, black <clears throat> heroes in comics, and um, we talked about representation mattering and stuff like that. Right now, we're well into our third, going on our fourth year of ICC Magazine, and I'm wrapping up issue 12. Wow. It's quarterly, so. That's impressive. And you can get it on indieplanet.com. That's really good. 
I'm a very busy person. <laughs> you are. I mean, the fact that we, I mean, we were chatting over Twitter and all that other stuff, and that seems to be one of our main forms of communication <laughs> these days. Um, but uh, it's great to see what you're doing and what you keep doing and what you will continue to do, I should say. Um, when it comes to, though, the representation for, uh, well, for, for gay rights and for everything like that, when it comes to creative talents, is there anyone that's caught your eye uh, most more recently? Uh, more recently? Well, or in, in anyone in general, I should say. Uh, not at this time. I've been, well, like I said, it's been a rough year and I've been pretty self-absorbed. <laughs> But um, we well, I've, I've I've been talking with my my co-creators at ICC Magazine, and we're going to have to step up our game a little bit more. But we do have um, I have been representing more transgender artists in ICC Magazine, and um, some of those stories, um, yeah, my my assistant there, yeah. um. We've got some people that have been doing their work for a long time. Um, Jane and Mila Ponder are writing science fiction. D. Fish is doing a comic strip, and uh, the the main theme of her comic strip is sometimes finding yourself as a transition. She talks about uh, you know she was uh, Derek Fish for the longest time and having to do stuff, and she published stuff, and then having the awkward. Uh, issue of having to rewrite everything on Amazon after she transitioned and you know but um, you know, being trans being transgender is very complicated I don't know if it is so much for them as it is for the mainstream but um, it, it's it's interesting for me for people to uh, come into their own beingness and actually be able to express who they are and, and tell their stories. And so my interview with Dee Fish was um, pretty in depth, and um, I'm I'm still waiting to get the an interview out with Jana Ponder and so on, but um, Pavlin. But um, you know, everybody's just people. You know, they put labels on everybody and act like this one's weird and that one's weird and that one's odd and this one's weird and, and they're all people. They're all telling stories. It's, you know, what's, what is the problem? So, you know, we've got, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an alien on a strange world. All I got to do is try to promote stories and everybody else is like, well, you know, <laughs> I, it's hard to explain, but, you know, I've, I've, I went through my period where, you know, I went through ridicule and no one cared about the stories I was writing or the things that I had to tell and so you know I kind of paying back a little bit but you know that, that, that's the whole thing of ICC magazine is to promote the artists and get their stories out and um, we've got the holiday gift guide where we do a whole catalog like at the end of the year where people can go and look and say oh I can get this on Amazon, or I can get this on that website, or I can check this out or that out. It's a then it is a catalog of where to get independent comics work, which we didn't have back in two thousand seven. No, no, it's um, it seems like just trying to get comics in in local comic book shops was more. It's difficult. still hard. Yeah. It's still hard. But to get ones that are not your traditional CSI white male, et cetera, et cetera, is, is probably almost impossible. And I'm glad that the ICC is, is mm. there to at least promote those towns. And until we break those doors down, until we smash that glass ceiling, until we break those doors open and, and are granted equal access into the comic shops, you know, we're going to keep uh, giving people an option, you know, on where they can find independent comic stores. And it's it's great because it opens the eyes to for everyone to see the talent that is out there. It's not just about if you're male or if you're female or however you self identify. Yeah. It's, you have a as talent. long as you have a voice and tell a story, where you're welcome. Yeah. yeah, and I'm I'm glad you're you're promoting that. Truly, Pam, I am. 
Like it's it's amazing what's out there. So you're like my window into into that genre because it's like this is awesome. This is cool. This is a great artist. This is a great writer. And that's the that's the the headline of our magazine too. Exploring the infinite universe of independent comics. You're not doing any more traditional like. You're, so you're, you're focusing more and more traditional art media instead of 3D. It's things. a mix. I'm I'm transitioning back, and it's it's kind of I've got to I'm I'm going to continue doing Deviant Mind and CGI, but like I said, the uh, Tales of the Room World spec stories are going to be in traditional pen and ink and color. And so I'm, I have to use both sides of my brain, or I'm just going to wither. <laughs> but. Well, at least you can use both sides of your brains. I mean, even when I was in art school, I was it was difficult for me drawing. So <laughs> it's not easy. But I was always really good at illustrating. I just you know dealt with a lot of people that um, like to tear at my artwork. <laughs> <laughs> From a professional perspective, you're very successful. You created your house of muses you've done deviant mind you've been a, a talented artist and, and writer for a good 40 years do you consider yourself personally successful nope <laughs> not making as much money as I'd like to I've, I've still got a long way to go I've got a lot of stories to write you know even even though I've done my magnum opus it's like uh, it's not as successful as I would like it to be I really need to look at more promotion uh, but as a storyteller I'm still not doing it it's not going to happen how do you deal with failure uh, next project <laughs> <laughs> that's just the way life rolls with me oh, all right <laughs> next project yeah. sorry it's no, just no, the no. way my life yeah, I've had to go through, you know, it, I've been through a lot of stuff. I've been through a lot of stories. And um, like I said, I've messed up the camera showing you everything that's on this wall. And this doesn't even show half of what I've published. I've got 72 books in print. That's a lot. 40 years, 72 books. I mean, even Stephen King isn't that, that talented. Yeah. <laughs> There. I gotta, I gotta change my, change my uh, pace a little bit somewhere. But, um, yeah, um, like I said, you can find my stuff on Indie Planet. <laughs> you know, hiatus doesn't help anybody's career very much. But you know, there was, there was some personal problems, some health issues, and this and that. So, that, that, that. Yeah. so yeah, I'm back. I'm stronger than ever. I'm getting my stuff done. You know, I've made some promises to my dad and some other things and uh, I've got a lot to love to do. Everyone has an inspirational person that inspired them on their path. Who was that for you, either professional or personal? Mike Grell. You see that little insert of the, the, my character on your little bottom thingamajiggy? Yeah. That Mike Grell put his cowboy hat on me and for a photo op. I was like, I got to meet him a couple years ago in Louisville, Kentucky at a Comic Con at uh, what Galaxy Con or whatever and he, there he was and I had brought some comics with me and those are hanging up right here too. Mm -hmm. The Super Bowl Legion of Superheroes and this issue of the Warlord and uh, I came up to Mike Grell's table and I, <laughs> I couldn't speak. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, he says, hi. I was like, you have been my greatest inspiration from the time I was like, like 12. And uh, I said, is there any possible way I could get you to autograph these books for me? He said, oh, of course I do. You know, but Super Bowl and Legion of Superheroes and Warlord is like from the early mid 70s. Mm -hmm. He said, oh man, it's been a long time since I've seen these around. <laughs> So, yeah, he autographed those for me, and we stood around and talked for the longest time. I showed him my work, and uh, I got to meet his wife, and we chit-chatted. But this was the guy, Mike Grell, 
that I had started reading back when the early days of Super Bowl and Legion of Superheroes, Green Lantern, Green Arrow, this and that and the other. Then came out with Warlord. And so we spent a great deal of time together at that point. And so at this point, we got together in front of his booth. And um, while we were standing there for the photo, you know, his wife was standing there with the camera. He reaches over, takes the cowboy cat up. Cowboy, the cowboy hat off his head and throws it on me <laughs> and so now we got me tipping the cap there and uh, that that was my hero yeah yeah it was from him that I learned how to draw and uh, yeah I've, I, I followed him for years and years but yeah if, if there was any one artist that influenced me throughout all this time that would have been Mike Grell on the shows that's great. It's it's always great to meet your hero, and I'm glad to, um, I'm glad you got to spend some time with him. That's it's the wind beneath your wings. I'm telling you. <laughs> the uh, younger generation, of course, are looking at your work, and they're becoming inspired to be as creative as they can be. There are a lot of new CGI artists that came in behind me, and they're doing some really awesome work. Technology has really improved too. Over it's the really improved. There's some people that blow my stuff away with some of the stuff they're doing. Some of them are not really doing comics. They're doing, you know, one shot posters or this or that or the other, but they got some talent. Mm -hmm. They're, but they're looking at your work though as, as an inspiration and they're becoming inspired themselves. And how can they inspire the generation that follows them? It's all about the story. You know, like I said, um, and we've got some artists that are really doing some amazing, amazing old work. But, um, and uh, I know D. Board is doing a lot of 3D or CGI comic work. And um, there's some others I could name, but they're doing some really good stuff. It's all about the stories. You know, the stories you tell, the medium no longer matters anymore. We're, like I said, we're in the 21st century. Anything goes as long as you can tell a story with it. Um, and we're going to see a lot of great new things in the next 20 years. <laughs> well, I hate to say this, Pam, as always, but, you know, we always have fun talking to each other, and it's always great catching up with you again. Um, but our time is up. Our time is unfortunately up. It's it's, it's a shame, <laughs> uh, truly. But yeah. um, tell us where we can find your work, where we can support you, and um, you know, hopefully in in the future, I, I gotta come down to Kentucky because I I haven't been there in. Years. I would love to meet you in person. <laughs> you are welcome here. We've got a guest room. Uh, it's well it. kept. And I and I like cats too, so it works. Four star service. Yeah, we got cats. My assistant has gotten bored and has <laughs> taken off. He's napping in the cat bed right now. So. <laughs> So Poor little can, Bagheera. Where can we find you, your, your social media work? Uh, my home my home base is always going to be houseofthemuses.com. There's a link there where you can go read the House of the Muses, the comic series in its full entirety. Um, there's a link to go read A Deviant Mind. I have links for comic shops to buy uh, all of my issues, all of my books at comic shop rates. Um, including ICC Magazine, DB1, House of the Muses, what have you. Um, but houseofthemuses.com is always going to be my hub. But um, everything is there. And uh, I'm House of the... Oh, excuse me. I'm House of the Muses on Twitter. And uh, also House of, House of Muses on Facebook. So... Good stuff. Man, you keep it short, you can find me there. <laughs> uh, that's something I'll probably post on. Uh, I'll definitely link back to your Twitter and all that other stuff as well, too, for sure. Yeah, House of Muses is my Twitter. Nice. No Z. Well, you know, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Pam, thank you again so much for coming on the show. It's been yeah. a true pleasure. I really enjoyed this. We could do this again. We, we usually get so wrapped up, we can talk for hours I think we can. 
I haven't done a two hour podcast in, or interview in a, in a long time. So uh, do we have the strength? I doubt yeah, it. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> All um, right. Until next time then. For sure. So just quickly wrapping up, uh, tune in next week for another great interview. We are joined by Austin Hamblin, uh, who is, I know Austin. Yeah, he's a talented writer, great guy. And he's actually coming on tomorrow technically, but he'll be posted next week. And then we're going to have, uh, in September, uh, well, yeah, in September, we're going to have another comic creator who's escaping my name, but we're going to have a uh, Canadian musician, punk rock musician, uh, Biff Naked on the show. So I think that's going to be really entertaining and, and enjoyable. And um, yeah, I, I'm kind of geeking out about that. So okay, pop me a link and I'll check it out. For sure. Thanks everyone for listening, watching, tuning in next week for another great interview on Two Geeks Talking. To infinity and beyond. That works for me. Cool. <laughs> Thanks so much, fam. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Kurt. This has been great.